Uh, I'm just going to share a short video with you all uh, from Rotary International President uh, Elect uh, Hol Holger Neck. So I'll just flick the screen and that should come through. Good morning, everybody. I'm also part of a team, and I will be proud to continue President Mark Maloney's strong commitment to growing Rotary. I had an opportunity to speak recently to Rotarians in Rochester, New York. A former executive at Kodak was in attendance. And he told me that they all knew that photography would make the transition to digital eventually. They just never expected it to happen so fast. And they went from being the worldwide leader in their field to a company in bankruptcy in just a handful of years. Time will not slow down for us, but we will not let rapid change defeat us. We will capture this moment to grow Rotary, make it stronger, more adaptable, and even more aligned with our core values. Rotary has to change, and Rotary will change. And even if some fellow Rotarians will complain that it does not look like their old Rotary, we have to change. And it should not be a surprise that our vision statement begins with that word. Together, we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. And the vision statement forms the basis for Rotary's new action plan, which you will have the critical role to implementing. This new action plan, it's all about growing Rotary and helping us to adapt to the digital age. The time is now to take this action plan and run with it. Over the next five years, this plan will increase our impact, expand our reach, enhance our participant engagement, and increase our ability to adapt. I would like every Rotary Club to have a strategic meeting at least once a year. Each club should be asking where they want to be in five years and know what value it brings to their members. As you can see, Rotary is not just a club that you join. It is an invitation to endless opportunities. It opens opportunities to serve. In a project as big and historic as NPolio now, and also in a small community project where you just plant a tree. And it opens opportunities for you to live a richer, more meaningful life with friends around the world based on our core values. As Rotarians, we are blessed to take on leadership roles at this wonderful moment for our organization. Everything we do 
opens another opportunity for someone somewhere. And therefore, the theme for our year is Rotary Opens Opportunities. <laughs> So uh, that's uh, Hol President-elect uh, Holger Kanak at uh, the International Assembly announcing uh, his theme. And uh, I don't know about you, but I think Holger must have had a, uh, a sixth sense uh, because he was talking about Rotary having to change. And boy, have we changed uh, over the last uh, couple of months. Um, I can tell you now, I'm just looking here, we have now reached over 100 participants and I know that is the, the biggest uh, assembly, uh, or not assembly, our biggest online uh, meeting for District 9820 uh, because we have a hard limit of 100 participants and we actually had to extend it so that we could uh, get everybody in. So we are now running at 108. So congratulations everyone. Uh, that is an absolutely fantastic effort. And you are just showing exactly what President Holger uh, is saying. We have to adapt. And that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, yesterday, we had one set of uh, rules for relaxation uh, of yeah, what we could and couldn't do in our, all of our meetings, and in the afternoon, it got changed again. So we are adapting, we are changing, we are doing it as best we possibly can. So let's all just keep up the great work, uh, and we will get through this. Uh, we will get back to doing what we do best. Uh, and that is helping our communities and making a difference. I'd now just like to share with you a, uh, a PowerPoint, which we'll just uh, talk through. And Okay. So just want to, want to start off on, we all know Rotary has uh, a citation and who doesn't like uh, to be recognised uh, for the great work and, and everything that they do. And us in Rotary, I mean, we are the quiet achievers. We don't go out boasting and bragging about what we do. I personally think that we should. We should really boast about the stuff that we do. Let's go and show the world the great works that we are doing around the place. And for that, the international president is prepared to issue us all a citation. Previously, the citation was different uh, to the goals and that that was in the Rotary Club Central. Each of the presidents would, would create their own special sort of goals and that. What they've now done is in the Rotary Club Central, which we'll touch on shortly, they've set 25 goals in there. So for you as a club, go and have a look at those 25 goals. Of those 25 goals, all you've got to choose is 13 of those goals and you can get recognised for a, a Rotary Presidential Citation. It's that simple now. Some of the things are just, you know, we are going to work in the community and we're going to engage in X. We're going to increase our membership. Very simple goals and they are all achievable. Nothing is too difficult. So I encourage you with your clubs, your boards to work together. Go and have a look at the, uh, the club goals in the Rotary Citation pages and just choose 13. Choose 25. And let me assure you, if you sit down and plan your way through it, you would get your 25 goals so you can do it easily. And then you can get a signed certificate 
from the Rotary International uh, President. As I said, who doesn't want to be recognised? This year, in 2019-2020, uh, Rotary International came up with a new strategic uh, plan with an action statement and you can uh, read it there. Together we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe in our communities and ourselves. That's the vision. And to go with that vision, they've created four key priorities that they would like us all to look at. This strategic plan, as I said, started this year and it's a five year plan. So we've, we're right at the front uh, of it. So we've got plenty of time to have a look and engage in the plan and see how that can strengthen uh, Rotary in our communities. So of the four priorities, the first one is we need to look at how we can increase our impact. How, do we, how are we really doing that? Our biggest project that we have is eradicate polio. Can you imagine, you know, little old Rotary, we got rid of the second only disease in the world. We eradicated. We all know how close we are but we're not there yet. So we have to keep it front and center of our thoughts. We need to finish it because we made a promise that we would get rid of polio so that there would be no more kids uh, suffering uh, the hideous disease. Just recently, you probably all heard uh, Sir Clem Renouf passed away. He didn't see the end of his dream of a polio world. So we have to finish it for him. That's his legacy. What legacy are we going to leave? Focus on all of our other programs uh, that we do in the communities. We've got peace fellowships. We've got all, look at all of our different youth programs that we get involved with. I know our district really gets engaged with the youth programs, which is absolutely fantastic. There's scholarships, there's all the different grants. So we've just got to keep engaged and keep leveraging off those programs because that's what the people see and that's where we make that difference. We also need to make sure though that all the work that we do has tangible outcomes we have to make sure that they are a sustainable program. You know, Rotary over the years has had lots of programs and we've learnt from our mistakes. We now go out there and you can really see the benefits and we can measure the impacts that we are having. So that is everything that you do. That is key to what we need to ensure that is in our minds at all time. How can we achieve it? Are they sustainable and making a real difference? We've also got to look at how we can expand our reach. Does your club truly represent your community? Do you know who all the different groups are in your community? Are they engaged in your club? If not, why not? We need to be all inclusive. So I challenge you all to go out there and really take a good, long, hard look at what your communities are and who is there and how can you engage those people? How can you get them into our Rotary Clubs? Because they all bring something to us and they make Rotary what Rotary really is. Look at all the different channels uh, that we have. Our world is changed. COVID has made that blatantly clear. Our world has changed. 
we have to change. We need different club models. Exactly like we're doing today. We are doing district assembly totally differently. We're now meeting online. We've got clubs that are meeting in person and online. We've got passport clubs. We've got all of these different channels that are now open to us. We need to look at how we can expand our reach into those areas. We need to look at different ways of doing our events, different ways of doing our fundraising, different ways of doing our service projects. We've proved that we can. So let's keep that challenge there. Let's keep on going. Let's keep challenging ourselves. And that really is going to open Rotary up. It is going to become more appealing to a greater variety of person. We, we have had a big focus on youth and they are the next generation of Rotarians. But there is more than the youth. There are our other community members that we also need to engage. Let's make Rotary appealing for them. Are you proud to be a Rotarian? Are you proud to go out and wear the badge? People, Rotarians, we are known across the globe. Our brand is a trusted brand. People know us because we are people of action. We've got people like the Bill Gates Foundation who give us the money. Why? Because they trust our brand. So we need to ensure that everything that we do meets the goals and expectations of Rotary so that we can really progress our, our brand. And in doing that, we are going to make a bigger impact across this globe of ours. The next uh, key objective is participant engagement. So how can we as district support you? District is there to support the clubs. You don't have to be an island. You don't have to think that you're out there and that you have to do it all alone. We are there to help you. We want to help you. We want to make you the best possible club that you can be that's got the best possible members in the club. That's gonna build the excitement. You've got your club, you've got your cluster, you've got the district, you've got the zone, you've got Rotary International. We're all there supporting you. You just need to come and help us and ask us and we are gonna be there helping and giving you the tools that you need. We want to help you to develop, develop um, a, a very much participant-centred uh, approach. How can we do that? Let us work with you. We've got the membership team. We've got the public image team. Don't do it all alone. We want you to engage with us so that we can engage with you so that you can engage with your communities. Rotary is growing and expanding. It's creating new opportunities all the time. What professional connections can you offer members in your club? The club next door, they've got professional members. How can we share that? Do you mentor? How do, you, how do we introduce people into your networks? Rotary is a place of learning. Rotary is a place of connection. We've got to keep that going. We've got to build those relationships. And how do we do that? By engagement, by mentoring. And we provide leadership and skills training. Several clubs now are running junior boards doesn't mean you have, a junior is a young person. It can be somebody who has never been on a board in their life and they 
just sit and are mentored. They create small boards so that they can train. That's a great program. Do you do that in your club? Rotary International has created some amazing online learning tools nowadays. Uh, you, you've heard us talk about it and you'll continue to hear us talk about the online tools uh, and courses that Rotary have. They are just simply amazing. The huge amount of work that have gone, gone in. I urge you and encourage you, jump onto the Rotary Learning Center and have a look at what's there. From there, what other courses do we offer around the district? We're, we've entered into an agreement with Toastmasters. That is really starting to gain some traction now. There's even something in the Rotary Learning Centre about Toastmasters. So we have the tools, we have the people. Let's get out there and show that we care and that we do engage and we do train. The next key area is we've got to increase our ability to adapt. Have we done that recently? I think we have. But do you dream big? Let's gather the facts and let's make some informed decisions so that you know, we are prepared to take some risks. So Clem Renouf, 30 odd years ago, took a risk. Hey, how about we get rid of polio in this little community and look at where we are now. The world is our community and we are going to eradicate it. Do you think he took a risk? If that's risk taking, we can do it. We've proved that we can take big risks and we can achieve. We've got to streamline a bit of our governance and our structure and our processes so that we don't get bogged down uh, in the day-to-day -day governance and management of our clubs. So yeah, look, look at the recent example. We've, uh, with past district governor Tim Moore uh, and a uh, solicitor in uh, District 9800, we've fixed up the rules and bylaws for you. That is streamlining. Just grab those rules, go through them and adopt them. A, we've saved you 400 odd dollars and two, how much time have we saved? And you, you can be happy in the knowledge and safe in the knowledge that the rules do align with Rotary. That's the most important thing, that the rules must align with Rotary and of course with both the state and federal um, requirements. That's done for you. We've saved you time and money. You need to review and we need to uh, foster you know, different ways of doing things in our clubs. Do you have a 360 degree view of what is going on in your club? Boards don't be an isolated thing and sit down there and go to your members and say, we're doing this. You have to be inclusive. So just review your processes of how you are doing things. So we're right back to where we started from. They're the key objectives from Rotary. And again, you've seen the vision statement there. You know, we do make a difference. And to me, the key in all of that is together, people create change. Isn't that exactly what we as Rotarians do? We change, we change things, we change people. And so that's the challenge with the strategic plan for us to come together as people that can create lasting change in our communities. So how do we get there? Well, we all know the SMART goal 
principle. So I'm not going to try and teach you, teach you that. But just highlight a couple of points. Why do we do it? Because goals give us a sense of purpose. If you set a goal, you've now got something to aim for. Your goals, they need to be achievable. Get people involved with the goals. Engage your club. Engage your members. Engage your community. And people will come. People will follow you. Keep your eye on them. Keep reviewing them. We know in everything that we do, in every walk of life, we have a goal and we just tweak it along the way. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Set your goal. Set your goals high and shoot for them. Get other people involved. Get other clubs. Get district involved. Get other districts involved. And all of your goals can be achieved. So where do you start? Well, I've just said that Rotary International have just updated their strategic plan. Does your club have a strategic plan? If it does, review it. Review it in line with the current Rotary International district plan. If you use that as the basis, you can't go wrong. And then just modify the strategic plan to suit your particular communities. And when I say modify, I don't say mod mean modify RIs. Just add your things to the bottom of it. It doesn't have to be much. Just one or two little key things. And that way you, you know you're in line with RI and you're working with your community. If you don't have a strategic as I said, make sure your strategic plan and your ideas align with the needs of your community. Not what you think your community wants, but get your community involved so that they're telling you what they want and then you can work towards that. So now we're going right back to where we started from, goals. You heard me mention Rotary Club Central. That's where the leadership team of your clubs go and enter the goals. That's the web address of where to go. And yes, all of these PowerPoints and everything will be available to you after this. Uh, and there will also be the Rotary uh, citation. There will be the Rotary strategic plan documents there uh, for you to, to get hold of as well. But this is what Rotary Club Central uh, looks like. And so you can see there, it's a very, very simple form to fill in. The hardest part of filling this form in is talking with your clubs and nailing down exactly what you want to put in there. So club membership, yeah? what is your goal? You know, and you stick a number in there. If your club has 27 members and you want to reach 30, all you've got to do is put the number 30 in there. That's a goal set. As I said, there is 25 of these to get your citation. All you need is 13. What you just need to be aware of, as you can see here, where my mouse is wiggling around the screen, you've just got to make sure that you select the right year. And there's two little buttons on either side here that lets you move backwards and forwards. So you can go back and have a look at what last year's, or we're still in this year, I suppose, uh, team have put down for their goals. All you've got to do is you click advance to go to 2021, and then you can enter uh, your goals. So that's, that's basically where, where I'd like, like to leave it. Just remember, I want you to have an awesome year. It is your year. You own it. But above all, you know, we are Rotarians. 
You can see down in the bottom right hand corner there, we are one. We are Rotarians at the end of the day. Yes, yeah, sure, we belong to a club. But really, globally, we are one. We are Rotary. We are Rotarians. It really is true that when you are traveling, if you ring up any Rotary club, you are welcomed in there. Why? Because people trust and respect us. We are one. We are Rotarians. And that is one of the key things that I'd like you to think about during, during your year. How can we engage with one another so that we really are seen as one organisation, not a whole lot of little islands. So again, have an absolutely awesome year. I know it's going to be challenging, but because we are Rotarians and we are people of action, we will achieve and we will make a difference. So I've just given you a bit of an overview there. We have Trudy Grice, who is an amazing person uh, from um, Rotary International in Parramatta. They are doing it tough like the rest of us. They are working from home, but they are still supporting our clubs. So Trudy, personally, thank you very much for the difficulties I know that you, you guys are facing. Uh, and thank you uh, for coming on today and being a part of our, our district assembly. And Trudy is going to teach, or go through a little bit about Rotary, my Rotary and the importance of it. And I'm sure she's also going to touch a little bit on that magical place, uh, the Rotary Learning Centre. So everyone, Trudy Grice uh, from Ripso. Thank you very much, DGE Mark, for that lovely introduction. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you all this morning through the, the magic of Zoom uh, from my home office. Uh, as Mark said, uh, our office, we have been closed for about three months now, and uh, we've all been working from home. We've just started to reopen. There's 12 of us. We're divided into two teams. So uh, my return to the office will be uh, tomorrow. And uh, I am looking forward to seeing my colleagues in person again. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. This is the moment I always hold my breath slightly to make sure it's all working. I just need the slideshow to come up. There we go. So uh, I'm going to start by saying, well, what an interesting year that we are living in and living through at the moment. This is really a moment in history. So future generations will be looking up 2020 on uh, Wikipedia or whatever the equivalent might be in the future. And uh, maybe they're watching a movie about when we live through the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, you know, the time when the world caught a virus, how it spread around the world very rapidly, how people reacted. Uh, how the people of the world had to survive by being physically isolated but remaining socially connected and really leveraging a lot of technology platforms to enable that. And then I think the Wikipedia article might start talking about how the world changed after the year of great disruption. So will Rotarians in a hundred years time, will they be looking forward to celebrating the 200 year anniversary of Rotary in Australia and New Zealand? I certainly hope so. And I hope that they'll be looking back at Rotary's history at this time when we're grappling with a pandemic and looking at the lessons that were learnt and what we did, how we changed and adapted. There's no doubt that all of our Rotary clubs across Australia, everywhere in the world, they're massively disrupted. Uh, we're not able to meet in person as usual. Uh, our service projects have mostly been deferred or delayed, although there's new service projects have come about because of the situation. And uh, if you're looking a little bit tired like me, perhaps that's because you were at the Rotary International Virtual Convention last night, um, held at 11pm our time. I should say aloha, I'm here with my lay on today. And uh, 
you know, I think uh, one of the, the main lessons that history is going to show to us is how an organization that started back in 1905 as a business networking club and has evolved into a global organization uh, with our board of directors and our foundation trustees living in countries all over the world, how this organization has pivoted and changed very quickly um, to support Rotarians in continuing with our mission. So, uh, you know, with the Rotary Convention last night, um, how disappointed would President Mark Maloney have been that he couldn't hold his convention in Honolulu in person? However, what an amazing opportunity, and I know that they achieved more than 50,000 registrations. That's sort of the biggest number of Rotarians ever that have connected, and that's been um, made or created through the magic of technology. So let's talk a bit about technology. Let's talk about my Rotary. And I think this is one of the secrets of Rotary. Uh, you know, the fact that we have this platform has meant that um, we can pivot very easily in this difficult time and we can share information very easily. So what I know about uh, your district, District 9820, is that 40% of members have got a uh, My Rotary account created. I don't know how often they're going in there, but I know that 40% have one created. But what that also tells me is that there's an amazing opportunity for 60% of Rotarians in your district still to create a My Rotary account and get access to all the information and resources that are available in there. So I'd really encourage you this year, really talk to your, your club, uh, we're obviously looking for ways for Rotarians to be engaged with us, even if we're not meeting in person. And, you know, getting active on my Rotary is a great way to do that. Now, we just heard DGE Mark talk about Rotary Club Central, work on your club strategic plan, set some goals. Set yourself up for success with the Rotary Citation this coming year, uh, only needing to achieve 13 out of 25 goals. And most importantly, going back and actually recording those achievements. Not only recording that you've achieved the goals, but put a bit of information into Rotary Club Central about those great service activities and projects that you run. Because one of the real values of Rotary Club Central is building up data um, and the dashboards come to life after data has been entered for a number of years. It creates a really solid um, history of information for your club to utilize moving forward. The Brand Center. Now, I don't know how any club can operate today without accessing the Brand Center in my Rotary. So I'm sure you'll be doing a session separately on public image, but really my role here is to encourage you to go and have a look at the Brand Center in Rotary Club, uh, my Rotary if you haven't already. Not only can you pull out your club's logo just from the templates that are available, you can also really use a lot of the resources in there to tell your club's story. These are some posters I've done for my own club. Um, that's my husband and I doing graffiti removal. I know that's a service project that people are still working on, um, even through this sort of physical distancing period. Uh, and the next one was a, a big service project we did together with Parramatta C Sydney Council and the Parramatta Light Rail. So those pictures really help your club come to life and tell its story. There's plenty of other resources in the Brand Center. Um, there's a new PowerPoint template that everybody can use. There's also brand new um, guidelines for branding of um, sanitizer and face masks because a lot of clubs now are wanting to um, produce those or to acquire them and to give them or, you know, sell them. And uh, it's a great opportunity to raise your profile and put your um, club logo on there. So that's just a peek into the Brand Centre, but if you haven't explored that yet, that's well worth it. Now the Learning Centre I want to spend a little bit of time on. I really have to acknowledge the uh, effort that my colleagues in the Rotary International Learning and Development Team, what they have done in terms of building content to go into this. This is a world-class online learning platform and there are many different courses in there. So 
if you're going in for the very first time, there's a, there's a getting started module. Uh, and that could be a good place to start just to learn how to navigate and what you're looking at. Uh, my hot tip for anybody who's going into the learning center, when you first go in and you land on the uh, very first screen, there's a filter button up in the top left, go there and select English. So that's going to limit all the course content to English for you. Otherwise, it can be a, a little overwhelming as you see all the content in every language that Rotary supports. Now, when you get in there, uh, you might be wanting to do a course that's for your specific um, club or district role that you might be taking on this year. So it could be, for example, um, you're a club president, there's a whole learning plan there, which is a selection of courses that are useful for you as a club president. There's also a lot of downloadable resources that are now in there. So in the past, when you attended different training events, often there was a manual that was handed over to you. Well, now all of those, instead of having physical manuals that um, cost money to produce and to transport, all that information is now in these learning center modules. And you can simply go into them, you can download the resources and you can save them onto your local computer. Or if you want to, you can print them out, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, but that information is all in these learning modules. Uh, if you perhaps want to work on some management skills or some soft skills, there's plenty of courses in there around leading change, managing conflict, uh, there are courses in there that are suitable to actually um, use at a club meeting in the future or if you're meeting online, perhaps you want to work through one as a group. Uh, there's a diversity course, there's a course about harassment, um, there's, there's a whole lot of different things in there. And the ones which DGE Mark touched on is the new Toastmasters courses. They're very exciting. They are hot off the press. And to find them, um, you might think, well, I'll just go alphabetically and look through everything and look for T for Toastmasters. That's really not the way, uh, because the courses are called Developing a Speech and Delivering a Speech. There's also a Toastmasters Getting Started. So what I do is I go to the search bar that's at the top of the screen, and I just type in whatever the topic is that I'm searching for. So Toastmasters is a good one. I've actually got those on my screenshot in front of me there for deliver a speech and develop a speech. Uh, they're very interactive. They're really great um, and entertaining modules to do. So I'd really encourage you, again, if you're mentoring younger people as well, encourage them to get on there and have a look at those courses. They're very useful for developing skills. Uh, now, another new feature of the Learning Centre, which was introduced only a couple of months ago, is called Learning Topics. And Learning Topics is social learning. So what was recognised was that Rotary International was preparing a huge amount of content and sharing that. But when you look at our collective learning and access to resources around the world through all of Rotary, uh, you know, people come across a lot of very useful information that they want to share back. So a new section in the Learning Centre is being created. And to get there, uh, when you're in the Learning Centre, you go to the little menu, which is just the little three lines in the top left of the screen. It drops down and then you can select Learning Topics. That's going to bring up a new screen. So in this screen uh, is a number of, oh, sorry, find that yet. Yeah. There's a number of categories there. So we have um, the first row of information is uh, topics and information that Rotarians from around the world have uploaded. And uh, you can see there's <clears throat> some really interesting ones that somebody there's just done around financial reporting, preparing club balance sheets. That's certainly not something that Rotary International has produced, but that's something that's really useful when you're running a club. There's a whole section there on meeting online. And I guess, you know, when we first had to pivot to really utilizing Zoom uh, to enable our meetings, my colleague Leanne Seawright, she uploaded a, a number of resources in there around best practices for running meetings on Zoom, uh, you know, having the Zoom virtual backgrounds like I have working today. Uh, and just a whole lot of Q&As, you know, how can you do a, a new member induction when you're meeting online? So there's loads of resources in there. 
membership of course is always a hot topic you know how can we do more to engage members how can we find new members what are our plans there's a whole section there on membership as well there's also a video that's available there of uh, president mark maloney welcoming new members to a club so you know those are resources that are available for you to download and use in your club meetings I did see last night at the Rotary International Convention that some of the presentations and things from the breakouts are going to be made available for download through this learning topics, I believe, as well. So something definitely to go and have a bit of a look at if you haven't seen it yet. On the right side of the screen is actually um, a Q&A section. So if you have a question on any of the information, you can uh, put that information, sorry, question there and uh, it will, um, there's moderators who will go on and respond to your question, hopefully in a quite timely manner. You're also able to give a star rating to the resources that you see so that you know uh, what's useful. So I think you'll agree that there's a huge amount of um, information available in the Learning Centre. Uh, I do or have started to receive a report what I know is that um, our zone, Zone 8, Australia, New Zealand and the South Pacific, uh, we are the fifth largest user of the Learning Centre in the world. Um, so I think kudos to us that we're really taking this and we're embracing it. I also know um, that only 10% of Rotarians in Zone 8 actually have gone in and activated this. So again, it's a great learning opportunity. Um, great to speak to your club members about, get them engaged. And uh, particularly when people are looking at their, their dues that they're paying for their club memberships and really trying to understand, well, what's the value that I'm getting for my club dues? Uh, let's make sure that everybody's really aware of these resources and information that's available to them. Now, I wanted to spend the last few minutes just sharing some really good news with you, which is about my Rotary. There's an upgrade coming. I know I started working with Rotary International, it was October the year before last, and when I joined I was told there's an upgrade coming, this is going to be terrific, you're going to be able to share this with everybody in the next sort of six to twelve months. Well it's taken a little bit longer than that, but uh, you know to upgrade a, a platform onto a new technology base and to make sure that it's going to work around the world uh, in multiple languages, I guess, does take a little bit of time to make that come to fruition. But we're almost there. So fingers crossed, um, providing that the final stages of testing uh, work out okay. In about the middle of July, I believe we're going to start seeing some communications come out about the first release of the My Rotary upgrade. So I've given you a, a sneak peek screenshot there in front of you. Uh, a few of the main changes from this first release uh, obviously, it's going to look a little bit different, but the main menu options are going to stay the same. So it's not totally confusing for everybody. The main change in the current system, you know, you can go to your profile and your account settings, but it's kind of hidden away a little bit and difficult to find. Whereas what's going to happen now is that we're going to have a new home menu option. And that's where your personal profile is going to be. And it's also going to be where you can update your privacy settings around how much of your personal information would you like to make available. Because in this new My Rotary, as a Rotarian, you're going to be able to go in there and you're going to be able to search and connect with any Rotarian in the world. Uh, and so that's going to be pretty exciting, I think. As a club, you're going to be able to share information about your meetings. So at the moment, you know, our club find is fairly rudimentary, whereas in this new My Rotary, you're going to be able to say, well, our club, we have three different meetings this month. We've got a business meeting, a social meeting, a regular meeting, the regular meetings online, or, you know, some clubs, they change where they're meeting, you know, they rotate through different venues. All that information is going to be able to be captured and shared so it's more easy for people to visit and to locate your club. You're going to be able to uh, easily log into My Rotary from your mobile phone at the moment. I don't think you can do that, that can be problematic. Uh, and 
you're also going to have a simplified method of adding new members or reporting your club officers. I do realize that a number of clubs use Club Runner. That's absolutely fine. That continues as it does today. Uh, but just know that if you need to do those changes in My Rotary, it's going to be much simplified and it's going to be easier to find um, perhaps people who are coming back to Rotary and we want to connect up their previous record and history with us. So that's the sneak peek for my Rotary coming your way soon. So I'll just summarize and say that, you know, I'm really hoping that the history books of the future, they really um, show that there was a time of great disruption. There was a time when Rotarians had to take some time out to reflect. They had to look at developing their strategic plans, new ways to adapt and uh, really leverage the technology that's available to us today to gather knowledge, gather skills, and above all, commit to action to create that lasting change. Thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Trudy. Um, Trudy, uh, as I said, you, you, you are a fantastic resource um, for, for us. I know you support us in all manners of ways. And you, you've just given us a very small sneak peek into uh, what is behind the rotary.org uh, website. Uh, and a lot of the courses that Trudy was touching on there, you can do while you're having a cup of coffee. Some of them are nice and short, you know, five, 10 minutes will get you in, you know, completed a course and it'll also generate you a certificate. Some of the bigger courses will certainly take you over an hour to complete. So they are there, they're available for all levels of people that are uh, within Rotary. It doesn't matter if you've been in Rotary for a week or if you've been in for 30 years, there is something in the learning center there uh, for you. So thank you uh, for all of that. I can see a few questions coming or a few comments coming through on the chat line about uh, My Rotary and Club Runner. They are two entirely different things and they do two entirely different jobs. Um, contact um, the, uh, the district IT team. They can help and explain some of the differences that are there. Um, we're going to have a, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Mark Huddleston uh, give us a, a bit of a, a chat uh, about membership. Um, now I'm just going to, there we go. Um, Mark is uh, from South Australia from memory and uh, he has written an absolutely fantastic book. I encourage you to actually go and get the book. It's Creatures of Habit. Uh, I, re I got this uh, book uh, last year and it really is a simple book to read and it is full of some amazing information and it really delves a little bit into the psyche of clubs and people and all that sort of stuff. So we're, I think we're pretty privileged to have Mark uh, uh, you know, come along to our district assembly uh, and just share some insights on membership and what a precious resource uh, our members really are and what Rotary uh, does. So Mark, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. I'm just going to share my screen because I've got a presentation to do. So I'm hoping it's going to just all work like clockwork. And push this button. Are we good? Has everyone got that screen up? We're all good? Okay, I'm just going to push another button here. Won't be a moment. I'm just going to get me what I can see and what I can't screen. Okay, we're good. Um, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about uh, our most precious resource today. And when I ask the question, what is our most precious resource? The most common response I get is our members. And I sort of think the answer is close to that, but not quite. I actually think our most precious resource is time. Um, because it doesn't matter um, who you are, what stage of life you're in, you never know how much more time you're gonna have. And you, it doesn't matter whether you spend the day on the couch or whether you spend the day out in the community doing stuff, you're not gonna get that day back. So today's presentation is about the way we use and I think as Rotarians sometimes abuse that most precious resource of ours 
which is time. Um, so here we go. What, of course, is the number one reason given for people not wanting to join Rotary? Well, I find the most number one reason that I hear is I just don't have the time. So that's why today uh, I'm going to be narrowing in on that uh, topic of time and how we use it. A little bit of history. I joined Rotary back in 1997 after 10 years in Rotaract. At the time I joined Rotary, there were 39,846 members in Australia. Uh, fast forward to 2020, and the number has changed a little bit downward since then. 26,695 when I prepared this presentation a few, excuse me, a few months ago. So we've actually lost a third of our membership base in just over 22 years, and I don't think there's any other way of um, describing that as a crisis. Uh, and we need to address it drastically. I'm sure many of you have seen these uh, uh, age demographic pie charts which show uh, a very uneven distribution of age categories across the organisation. 50% um, of the general population is aged under 50, but in Rotary membership, it's only 12% of our membership base which is aged under 50. So I constantly get asked the question, how can we get a, a broader cross-section of our community? How can we get younger people involved? What is it that's keeping them away? What is it that's making Rotary not so attractive to that demographic? So as someone who has a lot of conversations in the membership realm, I get asked, how, you know, where are we gonna find these members? Um, where are they coming from? How do, we, how do we get hold of them and attract them to Rotary? I wanna just um, flip the question around a little bit. And when we think of people we'd like to attract into the organisation, not so much ask where are they and how do we get hold of them, but this question, how much spare time will they likely have? So I'm going to show you a few slides here of various different demographics of people that we would love to get into Rotary. And I'm going to ask the question of all of them, how much spare time do you think they've got? The first photo, university students. So how much spare time do you reckon university students have got? They're working, sorry, they're studying full time, possibly got part time job, sporting commitments, family commitments, other hobbies and interests. I think you'd all agree they're not going to have a lot of spare time on their hands. Let's have a look at the next group. Those are young people starting out in their career path. Um, they're working hard to impress the boss, maybe putting in extra hours to get the overtime and work their way up the ladder. Um, likewise, they will probably have sporting commitments or other interests and family commitments. They're not going to have a lot of spare time either. Uh, the next group is small business owners or managers, and I'm in this group. How much spare time do you reckon they've got? First one's there opening up in the morning, and often the last one's there locking up at night, and they're up till midnight doing bass and payroll and all that fun stuff. They haven't got a lot of spare time either. Um, the next group, the young families. We do have this rhetoric of Rotary being a family friendly organization. And I absolutely know that some clubs do this really well, but um, I think some clubs need to work on their family friendliness a little bit more. But um, my kids are both teenagers now. I've, I've, I'm past the stage of nappies, uh, but I'm, I'm sure those of your parents remember what it was like. It's a challenging time with with young ones in the house and not getting as much sleep as you'd like and that trip to the supermarket that used to take five minutes, now you've got to load up the prams and half the car to go and get a bag of sugar. Um, we don't have a lot of spare time as young parents and juggling, uh, juggling sorry, um, work commitments. The next group I want to look at is, uh, was once the domain of Rotary, the corporate executives, the high flyers, the movers and shakers. These guys are working longer hours and flying all over the place. Well, they haven't probably for the last three months to be fair. But um, the, the, again, another group of people we would love to get into the organization, but um, typically don't have a lot of spare time on their hands. Now, everything's gonna change when I show you this next slide, because now I wanna talk about the retirees. And all of a sudden we've got a group that has a lot more flexibility with how they use their spare time. Granted, I understand a lot of them uh, devote a lot of time to their family and uh, looking after grandkids. And they've earned the right to sort of fly north for the winter and have their extended holidays. Good luck to them. Um, but as a demographic, as a segment of our membership, I think you'll all agree that when it comes to spare time, the retirees are the ones that have more uh, time to give. And I believe the number one reason our organisation is dominated by retirees is quite simple. They're the ones with the time. Um, and if we want to if we want to get a broader representation of people, particularly younger people into the organization, I think we must look at what we're offering from a perspective of how we use the time of our volunteers. Um, and I want to use an analogy. It's not one that I thought up, but uh, it's one that I use quite a lot. 
and that is of uh, one of my favourite sports, and that's test cricket. And notice I put the word test before cricket. I'm a traditionalist when it comes to cricket. I can sit down and watch five days of cricket without any trouble whatsoever, and I just love the longer version of the game. But probably 30, 40 years ago, cricket administrators worldwide recognised that uh, the fan base was shifting, they weren't able to attract a wider audience, and they couldn't compete with other sports such as football, rugby, uh, you know, basketball, tennis, baseball, where a game's over in three or four hours. And over the last 30 or 40 years, you've seen various forms of the game change. We've got limited overs cricket, we've got 2020 cricket, which is, which is a big deal these days. Uh, and of course, the women's game has uh, really improved over recent years with greater exposure. Um, and there are so many more people now engaged in the game of cricket than was once the case when test cricket uh, and first class cricket was the only offering. Now me personally, I still love the test game. Likewise, there's a lot of Rotarians out there that still love traditional rotary, um, but we need to be able to offer different versions of rotary that are gonna suit people that are, more, um, that, are, that are more time poor. So I wanna ask a few questions about um, the way we use our time in rotary. And I want you all to have a bit of a think about the total time you commit to Rotary in an average year. And, and I'll stress that this year is not an average year. So um, prior to say February, have a think of this question, how much time do you think you all committed to Rotary in a year? And if you, if you can draw a little bit of paper in front of you, just draw a big circle, because we're gonna do another pie chart. Um, and I actually think I know the equation already you're gonna use to work out how much time you commit to Rotary in a year. I'll, I might touch on that later. But once you've worked that out, uh, I'm going to ask you another question. How much, what portion of that total time that you commit to Rotary in a year do you think you use for meetings or getting to and from meetings? Now, this is something I uh, uh, sorry, researched quite extensively in the process of um, putting my book together. And uh, this may come as a surprise to some, maybe not to some others, but I found that the average Rotarian uses approximately 60 to 75% of the total time they commit to Rotary across a year in either being at or getting to and from meetings. And the problem with that is, is that every other aspect of Rotary life, uh, the projects, the fundraisers, the uh, social events, uh, training events, such as what we're um, participating in today, has to be squeezed into that last sort of 25 to 40%. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this is a problem. I think this is a big imbalance. I think it's way out of kilter, and I think there's something we need to do about it. And I would suggest for many of you, have probably never seen it or thought about it or seen it represented this way before. I think this is a problem that we need to deal with. I'm gonna throw some other questions at you, which um, as club leaders to be coming into a new Rotary year, you probably all wanna consider some of these things about uh, how your meetings operate. And these are all questions you've probably heard before and they're quite reasonable questions to ask, such as, are our meetings interesting? Are they welcoming? Are they punctual? Are they professionally run? Are our meetings uh, uh, informative with informative and entertaining guest speakers? Do they represent good value for our members? And here's another one. Is the food and service good at our meeting venue? These are completely legitimate questions to ask about our meetings. And I would like to think that most of you can probably tick most of those boxes or hopefully are working towards uh, ticking most of those responses and saying yes. However, I'm gonna now ask you another question, which we never ask about our Rotary meetings, but I actually think it's the most important one we need to be asking. And here it is. Those of you who've got a pen in front of you might wanna write this down because I think this is the most important, the, the most important question I'm gonna ask today. Are our meetings a productive and effective use of our volunteers' time? Just have a little moment to think about that. Because when I'm in front of a live audience um, in some venue, as soon as I ask that question, I get a lot of faces looking at, back at me that look a bit like this, suggesting, you know what, I've never really thought about that. And that's maybe something we need to start thinking about. Because as I showed you before with some of the slides, uh, busy people don't have a lot of time to give. So the time they give must be effective and productive. It's really, really important. Here's something else that I asked in the process of researching my book, uh, and I did a comprehensive survey. I asked the question, what is it that we want from our meetings? And I've got many, many responses, which um, I sort of um, 
uh, consolidated into single word answers because they all meant roughly the same thing. And here are the top two responses I got when asking that question of Rotarians. What is it that we want from our meetings? Number one, they wanted entertainment. They wanted to be able to go to a meeting and have a good fun night, um, have an entertaining speaker and a bit of fun from the sergeant or raffle or whatever it is. They wanted to have a good time. Number two, number two thing they wanted from meetings is camaraderie. They love the weekly catch up with their friends, talking about what they're up to, what happened in their week, how the sporting team went, what their grandkids are up to. Uh, and I, for the record, think these two things are really, really important. So I'm not gonna diss them. And for the record, I think most clubs probably tick both those boxes um, and fulfill a sort of element of entertainment and camaraderie for their members. But I started thinking, you know, there's something missing from all this that's not showing up in the results. And then it struck me that given that 88% of our membership base are aged over, over 50, these two responses were being very heavily swayed by that 88% of people responding who were over 50. And I thought, well, the younger voice isn't really getting much of a show here. So what I decided to do is look a little bit closer at some of the responses and only look at responses from people under 50. And you may be very surprised to hear what under 50s are looking at, looking for from meetings, because it's very different from what the over 50s are looking for. Here's what I found. The number one thing that under 50 is looking for from meetings is productivity. They want to be able to achieve something at a meeting. And I've often made the mistake in the past of just assuming that younger people weren't interested in meetings. Um, and whilst I'm sure there are some that aren't, what I found when I looked a little bit harder was that they're prepared to come to a meeting, but they want to actually achieve something. If your meeting is about analysing, discussing, uh, and finding solutions to the problems in society, people who are falling through gaps, if your meeting is about planning some project or fundraiser, and you're actually achieving something, they feel like they're playing a part, and they feel like that's productive, and, and they don't see that as a waste of time. They see that as a, as a good reason to be there. The number two thing that the younger people are looking for from a meeting is networking. They want to be able to advance themselves uh, in the workplace and in society and meet people who can help them. And Rotary uh, calls itself a network. It's, it's one of the world's oldest uh, and widespread networks. However, uh, again, because of our age profile, uh, we have a very large percentage of retirees in our clubs. And once people retire, they do lose some of those natural networks. Some of them begin to atrophy. So for a younger person coming into an older club, they may not see the networking um, opportunities that they had perhaps hoped for. So when I then asked the question, well, how are clubs going with these two factors? And I was able to tick the top two. I've got to sort of put a question mark against these because I, there are probably clubs out there that are doing really well in this perspective. But I think there are clubs that really could pick up their game and offer more uh, from a perspective of productivity, i.e. achieving something at meetings and networking, okay? I often wonder how we've managed to put meetings at the centre of our Rotary universe. Um, I believe that we seem to venerate the meeting as the epitome of Rotary life at times and everything else we do in Rotary seems to have to revolve around the meeting. And that's not the model I would really like to see. What, I, what I'd like to see meetings replaced with is service. I'd really like to see service at the center of the Rotary universe with everything else, including meetings revolving around service, rather than having meetings at the center of the Rotary universe. And something I found really interesting in these uh, COVID-19 times is that it didn't take long for Rotary clubs to be able to latch onto the technology and start meeting online. And look, I think that's a good thing. I think it's great that we're still able to keep in touch with each other. But I, I've also found it interesting that we're a very uh, meeting-centric organisation, um, and we've, we've, we've found a new way to meet, but have we found new ways to serve? Have we found new ways to get out in the community and be active and make an impact in our community? And, and I think the jury is out on that one at this stage. I want to share a quote with you from one of the world's great entrepreneurs, and um, I don't know, a few years ago, he released his top six um, requirements of all of his, all of his uh, uh, businesses. And the number one on that list was, unless there's a specific purpose for a meeting, don't have one. Uh, and yet I reflect on the way we do things in Rotary and we seem to have a history of just having meetings, whether there's a purpose for them or not. And I just think this is a really important question to ask as we emerge from COVID-19 
and look at new models and new ways of doing things, do, are there actually genuine purposes beyond the, the entertainment and camaraderie of our meetings? And are we following our motto of service above self? I just want to finish up with a bit of a story about my own club, the Rotary Club of Seaford, uh, which I started uh, a few years ago. We've got a, our number one motto is less meeting, more doing. And at the Rotary Club of Seaford, we place an extremely high priority on hands-on volunteering opportunities. We're constantly looking for ways to keep our members active and give our club a high level of community exposure. And the secret to engaging our members in so many projects comes down to our flexible meeting program which frees up more time for members to contribute in more meaningful ways. We only meet twice a month. Our first meeting is on the first Thursday night of the month. Our second meeting usually falls on the third Sunday afternoon of each month. But that Sunday meeting can be combined with or substituted for a service project. And as it turns out, right at this very time, being the third Sunday of the month, my club is participating in a service project right now. They're doing a gardening project. And I'm not there because I'm speaking to you guys, which I'm happy to do, but as soon as I finish here, I'm going to be whizzing down and helping out with that project. And I've just stopped it at this example because how often do you see at a Rotary hands-on project three generations working on the same project? That's one of my favourite ever photos from um, the projects that we do. Here's another example of a community garden. We do a bit of work in. I'm going to show you a few more images. At the time, the gentleman on the left uh, was 73. He was the oldest member of our club. The young lad on the right was my son, Aaron. This is about three years old. He was 13 at the time. So having two people working alongside of each other on a Rotary project with 60 years between them. I love that photo. A few more photos I want to show you of this gardening project um, uh, and good reason for it because we've involved a lot of people in this that aren't Rotarians. Um, we paved the path through this um, garden. We sold those fundraising pavers that you know, businesses or individuals pay 40 or 50 bucks each and the, the whole project was cost neutral. But here's what I want to show you this photo, why I want to show you this photo. This gentleman here, partner of a Rotarian. The young lady here is a daughter of a Rotarian. Now it's a bit hard to see in this photo, but the young lad at the back on the cement mixer is the son of a Rotarian. Next photo. We have the wife of a Rotarian. We also have the next door neighbor of a Rotarian. A lot of non-Rotarians joining in in our projects. And I wanna tell you a story about this young lady here. When I say young, she's my age. Um, we knew each other as teenagers. We both went all the way through Rotaract together. At the end of my 10 years in Rotaract, I joined my sponsoring Rotary Club, which was the Rotary Club of Edwardstown. I was a member of that club for 19 years before starting the Rotary Club of Seaford. That whole time, for 19 years, on and off, I tried to get this lady, Sandra, to join Rotary. Uh, she understood the Rotary value proposition. Um, she was used to what Rotary did because as Rotaractors, we had a lot of involvement with our sponsoring club. My former club even sponsored her daughter to National Youth Science Forum. So she did have that uh, want to give back to Rotary and she really appreciated what Rotary did. But every time I asked her, the same response. I just don't have time. She's a very busy career woman and she just didn't have time. And I asked her on and off for about 19 years to join my former Rotary club. The moment I started a new Rotary club and I said, hey, Sandy, I'm starting a new Rotary club. We're not going to be based around meetings. We're going to be based around service. We're going to be meeting only twice a month. They're going to be very casual, informal meetings. We're going to be doing a lot of hands-on projects. She said, where do I sign up? I'm telling you guys, there are hundreds, potentially thousands of people right in your community that are going to be great for Rotary. They would be willing to do what uh, the sorts of projects we do and they can get something out of Rotary and give something back. But we've got to be able to offer the right version of Rotary. And I feel in many cases, we're not. So for those of you from a membership perspective who are casting your lines out, trying to hook new people into this organization, I want you to consider where you're casting your lines and are they biting? And maybe it's the bait. Maybe it's the bait on the hook. And if the bait on the hook is little more than meetings, I don't think a lot of them are gonna bite. You really need to be able to offer something beyond that. Um, we get a lot of people coming onto these projects and engaging that aren't members. Uh, that we wouldn't be able to attract along to meetings, but we can get them along to projects. And like I mentioned, we sometimes swap projects and we swap meetings uh, and we, we do a project and a meeting at the same time. I'm going to wind up now with one slide. And this is my, the greatest piece of advice I can give to a incoming leader of a Rotary Club from someone who's been training leaders of Rotary Clubs for many years. And that is about the process of change. I've been a change maker. I've been trying to get Rotarians to change for as long as I can remember. 
And the number one reason change doesn't happen in Rotary Clubs is because leaders have this paralyzing fear. If we're gonna change, we're gonna lose members. And I'll admit that it is true over the years we have lost members who have felt the pace of change has been way too fast. But I can guarantee you, we have lost many, many more members who have felt the pace of change has been too slow. Many, many more. And that doesn't even take into account the amount of members that we've, we've never got in the first place. They've never joined because we haven't been able to keep up with the times and we haven't been able to keep the pace of change fast enough. So please put that one in your kit bag. And if you're trying to implement change in your Rotary Club this coming year, uh, and someone saying, oh, we can't change too fast, the members aren't gonna like it, just remember that we lose far more members uh, because we're not changing fast enough. I'm gonna leave it at that and I wish you all the very best for your years ahead and thanks for your time today. Fantastic, thank you, Mark. That is uh, absolutely brilliant. And a lot of what Mark was touching on is what we, we touched on in the new strategic uh, plan. You know, we need to do things differently. Uh, we need to be more flexible and we need different models of how we uh, have our clubs. His book, Creatures of Habit, let me assure you, he's only scratched the surface and looking at the chat, he's certainly challenging a lot of our thinking. So, and that's exactly what it's all about. If people are interested and want to know more about how to get this book, uh, shoot me a message uh, and I'll get in contact with Mark uh, and make it available. From memory, it's about $25 or some, something like that, Mark. Uh, it's it's twenty four ninety. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, by the way, uh, Tim Moore's got a few copies sitting around his office too. Oh, well, there, there you go. But Don't harass me, harass uh, past district governor, oh, you Tim. harass me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for, for being involved. Um, now, Rotary, we have our foundation. Our foundation is the engine room. Our foundation is what gives you guys money to go and work in the community and things like that. You know, we have a passion for ensuring our foundation does good works around the world. So today I think we're, we're very privileged to have uh, Rotary Foundation Chair Sam Camparali uh, just to give us a bit of insights about what our foundation is and really how the, co the great cogs of this turn and make a difference. So Sam, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to be here. And uh, interestingly enough, I think um, what, um, what Mark was just talking about and some of the chat that's been happening um, that I've been watching leads really well, I hope, into, uh, into what I'm going to uh, uh, speak about this morning. So I'm just gonna bring up my presentation so we don't sort of interrupt uh, too much. So, um, Share the screen and I'll bring that up. Okay. It was late in the afternoon of the 25th of March, 1992. And I was actually declared dead on that afternoon. Along with two colleagues, I was driving home to Hobart. I lived in Tasmania at the time. I was driving home to Hobart from a business trip up in the north of the state and I was involved in a high speed head on collision on the Midlands Highway about 100 kilometres uh, from Hobart. The media announced that it was a fatal car accident and my colleagues who were in the car with me thought I was dead. The chap who was in the front passenger side was an ex uh, policeman from the Northern Territory. Uh, apparently he, he took a, one look at me, thought I was dead he managed to clamber out of the accident and go and help the other victims. Now, obviously I wasn't dead. Um, and thankfully no one was actually killed in that accident. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because it might give you some perspective as to the severity of the accident and the seriousness of my injuries. I was in hospital for, for about two months and I underwent several major operations. And over the next two years, um, I had more surgery and had to undergo a lot of physiotherapy and rehabilitation so that I could walk properly again and, and so on. And during that whole time, I was in fairly constant pain. 
So you can imagine um, how I was feeling quite depressed. Anyway, one afternoon I was in the rehab clinic um, and I was doing some strengthening work with my physio. I was sore, I was frustrated, and I was feeling pretty sorry for myself and uh, felt like giving up and just going home. But it was at that moment during this session that I experienced a very powerful thing that I'll never forget. Um, it, it just changed my life and brought Rotary into my life. There I was doing these exercises, uh, feeling very frustrated and miserable at the situation where I see a young Indian girl uh, come in. She was about nine or 10, perhaps I'm guessing, um, and her mother come into the room along with their physio. The young girl was fitted with calipers um, and they came over close to where I was doing my exercises. Her physio started to work with the young girl, um, making her walk backwards and forwards using some handrails that had been set up. I could see that this uh, young girl was really struggling to, uh, to walk. I, I honestly don't know um, the full story of how this family came to be in Australia, how they got into this situation. But anyway, uh, it was the case and the, the little girl was um, struggling and she'd had enough and she sort of um, turned to her mum and she said, Mum, when will I be able to walk properly again? And the mum looked at her uh, and looked at the physio in utter horror at the question, full well knowing the answer already. And the physio gently shook her head and I heard her say quietly because they were very close to me, polio has permanently crippled your daughter. Obviously, I don't think the little girl understood at that, really understood uh, at that moment. Now, this whole episode and discussion only took a few minutes. We were in a public place and I couldn't help but overhear the conversation. It was an emotion charged situation and was quite intense. And I realized that I had stopped my own exercises and tears were streaming down my face. I couldn't help it even though I was in a very public situation and there were other people around. I was crying, full on. I went home that afternoon and I told my wife, Lee, the story. I said to her then that I would stop feeling sorry for myself, understanding that there were others that were in uh, much worse situations uh, than me. But I had to find a way to be involved and help others in whatever capacity I could. It was some time later that I read about Rotary International's campaign to end polio, and that attracted my attention. Like many of my friends, I didn't know anything about Rotary at the time, so I started to find out more. I just knew I had to find a way to contribute, and in the end, joining my Rotary Club provided me with the opportunity to do my bit. This is the reason I joined Rotary. I joined Rotary. Uh, maybe different to some of the um, reasons that Mark was talking about before, but that's my personal reason. Now, I just want to show you some facts. We've already touched on polio. Uh, DGE Mark's mentioned it a few times today. It remains the number one project for uh, Rotary International and the Rotary Foundation uh, until such time as we've uh, we've eliminated the disease. But I just want to show you a few facts from maybe a different perspective to what you always see. We always know how close we are to finishing uh, or to ending polio. We always talk about, you know, things like polio fatigue and it's been going for such a long time. But I just want to show you a few, uh, few stats there that you can see in front of you. That is a huge achievement to date, regardless of what happens and regardless of the challenges we are facing right now, we have already through this end polio program, saved 1.5 million lives. That's 1.5 million people alive today that without the work of Rotary International and the Rotary Foundation would not be with us today. We've eliminated polio from 123 countries. And we've immunized 2.5 billion children. You can see there that to date, we have achieved a huge amount. And I think that's something we need to remember and be very proud of when we do get frustrated um, with the fact that eliminating the last couple of pockets of polio is taking some time and is presenting some challenges. So we will ultimately eradicate the disease, I believe that, but we do need you and your clubs to continue to support and fund this work. But again, just look at those statistics and remember, be proud of what we've achieved so far as an organisation.
Now, it took me a few more years in Rotary before I fully understood the magnitude and variety of life-changing projects uh, undertaken all over the world every single day. Now, this list, um, this slide just lists the programs of the Rotary Foundation. I'm sure many of you are probably familiar uh, with those uh, programs. They're split into two broad areas that you can see, humanitarian aid and education and training. So the aid side, we've talked about polio, um, and then we have a number of different types of foundation grants. Um, and we talk about making a bigger impact in the world, um, making a difference. Those grants are the magic of the Rotary Foundation. That is what helps us uh, continue to make a difference in the world. And then you can see the education and training ones. I mean, I could spend a lot of time talking about Rotary Peace Scholarships and, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to meet and engage with a couple of peace scholars um, that, you know, have had a, made a profound difference in their geographies in the world. And you can see the other um, uh, training programs there listed on that slide. A um, couple of what new ones there that I'll touch on a bit later, the Disaster Response Grants and Projects of Scale Grant, they're relatively new. Disaster Response Grants has been around for uh, about 12 months and Projects of Scale Grant is new this calendar year. Um, and I'll touch on those very briefly in, in a moment. But just to give you an idea, since the inception, inception of Disaster Response Grants, uh, and as I say, that's been less than 12 months since that's been around, the foundation has approved nearly US $6 million for Disaster Response Grants alone. And of that, almost 5.2 million US dollars has been for COVID-19 related activities. So just that grant program alone, um, we've been able to adapt, as you heard um, DGE Mark talk about before, we have to adapt. These changing times are forcing us to, uh, to do things differently. And our foundation has adapted very quickly and provided uh, response grants and global grants to support COVID-19 work amongst other things. In Australia, we've been a very strong recipient of those disaster response grants. We've got a number of grants during the uh, disastrous bushfires we had earlier. Uh, and of course, we've also been recipients of disaster response grants for COVID-19 related activities. <clears throat> now, this next table is just a, um, uh, a summary of, of district and global grants from, that you can get through the foundation. I'm not going to go into any detail this morning. You probably have an awareness of those two types of grants um, already. And I'm sure you're going to learn and hear more um, in the upcoming dedicated foundation training or webinar that uh, um, DGE Mark and uh, um, Tim have uh, planned for you. I think it's in the next week or two that you'll be having a dedicated foundation uh, seminar. So it, you'll get a lot more information about these grants there. But I just wanted to make the point um, that there have been a few significant changes to foundation grant funding that you need to be aware of. One of them, which is a positive one, is that there's been an increase in the World Fund Global Grant Match from $200,000 to $400,000. So in the past, when you submitted an application for a global grant, the maximum that you would get from the World Fund, from the Rotary Foundation, was $200,000. That's now been doubled to four hundred thousand um, dollars. So that leads us to you know opportunities where our uh, global grant uh, projects can be you know in excess of well in excess of eight hundred thousand um, dollars to do a a global grant project. Item two on that slide is one that's only just been um, uh, announced. It was only announced last week, or well, I only found out about it last week. It may may have been announced earlier, but um, I only found out about it last week. Because of the huge demand on the foundation uh, finances uh, over the last uh, six to nine months, um, they've had a massive increase in the number of global grant applications. Um, a lot of that uh, has been to do with COVID-19 and the amount of global grants um, and funding they've contributed to that. What will happen is that uh, World Fund resources will be used to match only district designated fund contributions two global grants from now on. So that will remain at one for one or 100% match as it has been for a long time now. But the big change is that the match on cash contributions to grants will be eliminated. 
effective July 1st, 2020. So next, this upcoming Rotary uh, calendar year, cash contributions to grants will be eliminated. Now, in the past, when there's been cash contributions to a global grant, the foundation's contributed 50 cents to every dollar towards that. That's not gonna happen anymore. Um, that will be reviewed in 12 months time. Uh, it's been brought about, as I say, by the huge demand on, on uh, foundation funding um, and, uh, and the increase in the ma massive increase in the number of grants that are being awarded. So I'll talk a little bit more about fundraising and what that means um, uh, in a moment. Disaster response grants I've already talked about. That is a dedicated um, uh, fund. The money that goes into re disaster response grants goes straight back out to disaster response grants, very similar to polio. Uh, what goes into the polio account gets spent only on polio activities. And there is a new programs of scale grant this calendar year. That's one grant uh, awarded to a district or club anywhere in the world. Um, it's for a major or significant humanitarian project. That is, you know, the sort of project that's going to last three to five years. Um, involve significant partnerships with other not-for-profit organisations and service organisations, and the award is up to $2 million for that particular grant. There's only one grant per year, um, and to apply for that grant is quite a significant process, um, but as you, and, and as you would expect, you know, the, uh, the governance around the application and the management of that grant will be substantial, um, but it's a huge amount of money that it is there and it is available. Now, again, the foundation um, continues to support Rotary six uh, areas of focus or, or at six causes that I prefer to call them. I prefer to talk about causes. That's what people really um, support. That's what people join um, clubs and not-for-profit organisations. Um, it's usually because they're passionate about a cause. And mine was polio, as you heard at the outset. But there have been a few changes um, um, to what is covered by the areas of focus. Firstly, um, some of the names of the areas of focus have changed to better reflect the focus of the cause and what the cause really is. So for example, you can see the ones in gold, they're the three that have changed. Peace building and conflict prevention, for example, we used to call it peace building and conflict resolution. Well, the whole intention of the program really is to create uh, a world of peace to prevent conflict in the first place. So whilst resolution, conflict resolution remains a part of the program, it's really not, it was not the intent. The intent is to focus on peace building and conflict prevention. So just a few name changes to be aware of. Secondly, and more importantly, um, the focus areas have been amended to incorporate more environmental projects. So if you haven't done so recently, please download a copy of the uh, areas of focus policy statements that is in the, on the grants page of the Rotary International website and see what's been included. Uh, been a lot more flexibility and a lot more suggestions as to um, sustainable projects and, and around the environmental aspects of the projects that we do. So, uh, so just, um, just be aware of that and find out a bit more about that. It was a few years further still into my Rotary journey, journey that um, before I really understood the power of the Rotary Foundation and how it really works to further amplify the impact and the benefits of the projects um, that we do. Let me give you a few examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. And I won't take a long time, I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. This one, you may have seen this before, this is one that I like to use and I know some of my colleagues have used, uh, used the same example. But this was a global grant a couple of years ago um, that was a project of the Rotary Club of Bribey Island um, up in uh, Northern Australia near Queensland, um, District 9600. Now that, that was a club at the time of less than 10 members. And they had an idea to support um, a cervical cancer vaccination program in Pap Papua New Guinea, um, where they wanted to give that vaccination to 28,000 girls uh, in that age group of, of nine to 13. Now this is a club of less than um, 10 people. It's quite a substantial project and this is how they went about it financially. And this is where um, really the impact of the Rotary Foundation is significant. And this is um, important to understand uh, and take benefit of as clubs and districts, if you like. So this global grant for Papua New Guinea from Bribey Island 
Bribey Island themselves only put in $1,000 of their own money. So 0.3% of the total project funding came from the sponsor club. Through their own um, marketing efforts and PR and whatever, um, and visiting other clubs, they managed to get $100,000 of contributions from other clubs. And through their own district and other districts, they managed to get $98,500 of district designated funds from around the country. And against all of that, Rotary Foundation, through the World Fund Match, provided another $129,500 towards that project. So the total project was $329,000. It was a club of less than 10 members and the sponsor club, Bribe Island themselves, only needed to contribute $1,000 to get that project off the ground and happening to that order of magnitude. Now I can tell you in that particular instance, Bribe Island has not contributed anywhere near $129,500 to the foundation ever. Uh, that's sad because we want them to contribute more, but they are a small club and they do contribute um, what they can. Um, so the, in effect, they are a net recipient of foundation grant funds. So be aware of how you can multiply um, the funding for a project through the Rotary Foundation. That's really the key to the foundation and therefore how you can grow your projects and have a more significant and bigger impact on the communities that you're trying to help. Be they small projects in our own communities or be they uh, substantial projects internationally. And I've just got a couple of more, um, just a couple of more examples there. I won't spend a lot of time there, but you can see I've just listed a few examples. They're all um, uh, based in and around Australasia. Uh, and they relate to some of the projects where, um, you know, you can see there that uh, the global grant values that have been contributed, they all vary in size and type, um, but just a few examples there. So my, my message to you is take advantage of the foundation grants, um, be aware of how they work. You have, um, um, uh, you know, Charlie Spears and the foundation committee in your district to help you with these. Um, there are people, myself and others um, uh, around the country that can also help you work out how to maximise uh, the benefit of foundation grants for your club or your district. So take, you know, take the opportunity to, uh, to speak to, uh, to Charlie and his team um, and, and make sure that you're getting um, the foundation grants that are available. Now, the next one I was going to talk about, uh, I just wanted to take an opportunity, I'm sure you're probably aware of this, uh, but I just wanted to take an opportunity to give this a plug because this is also supported extensively by the Rotary Foundation. 2021 is the uh, is um, the centenary, Rotary Centenary in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and uh, one of the biggest projects is happening in our own region. And this is the Give Every Child a Future project. Um, it's um, um, Australia's only official centenary project. There's lots of other good projects happening, but this is the official one, if you like. Um, and uh, we are collaborating. Oh, no, it seems like that's better. Stopped. Um, we are collaborating with UNICEF on this project. Uh, and the project, as you can see, there aims to provide those three types of vaccinations to uh, um, about 100,000 children across uh, nine countries. So you can see there the Cook Islands, uh, Kiribati, Nauru, New Samoa, and you can see the others there across those Pacific Islands um, where we're doing that. And, and, and Rotary support there will help build the broader um, health system uh, for the sustainable delivery of vaccines so that the kids there, the generations of children to come, they'll continue to benefit in the long term. Uh, and the savings that the savings are actually come from lower hospitalisation rates um, of those diseases. That will provide the sustainability and ongoing financial support um, for that program. But in the meantime, uh, this particular project is looking for contributions from uh, uh, from anybody, clubs, districts, whatever, to uh, to help this program through to its conclusion. So I'd ask you to um, go back to your clubs if you can provide um, some sort of contribution to help this project. Um, I know that the coordinators would certainly appreciate that. But of course, to continue to be able to do these life-changing projects we, uh, with the support of the Rotary Foundation, it's imperative that the foundation continues to grow and remain financially strong. Now I heard uh, at uh, a, uh, last year's convention it was, I heard um, 
Rotary uh, Foundation trustee, Per Hoyen, uh, make this comment, if you want milk, you need to feed the cow. And it just really struck me. And I thought, yeah, how true is that? Now I'm gonna just present two different models of fundraising and giving. Um, they may be a bit controversial, but they're just for discussion, for debate, for consideration back in your clubs. This is the cycle of fundraising and giving that has become the predominant approach in most Rotary clubs today. Now, I'm not saying this is wrong, by the way. Um, there, are, there is room for the two models I'm going to present. But what happens a lot today is that the Rotary clubs will go out and raise money, do their barbecues, art shows, markets, whatever they do to raise money. The Rotary club will often then just write out a check and donate that money to another very good charity without them, um, give them to a charity. Um, that charity then goes off, does the work, delivers the outcome, and that charity builds up its reputation. The Rotary will probably get a thank you from that charity. We often don't get much more recognition than that. 12 months time, the charity comes back and asks Rotary for more money and that Rotary club then goes back and starts the process of uh, getting some more funds to give to that charity. But the only, um, really the only part benefit is to the charity that is taking our money uh, and delivering the outcomes. That's who the community sees um, out in their, in their local area is that other charity. So we need to think about how we do that. And as I say, there is room for this model in our, um, in our approach in our clubs. But I would ask you to think about this particular um, approach to fundraising and giving. Um, and this is where we can grow our reputation. And this also touches on uh, what uh, Mark Huddleston was just talking about as well. In this example, the Rotary Club raises the money through its usual channels. But instead of giving it direct to a third party charity, the Rotary Club uh, contributes uh, a portion of their money to the foundation. The Rotary Club then can apply for a grant at some point that's appropriate. Um, and the grant then provides funding for local or international projects or whatever it is that the club's going to do. The intent is that with that grant, members of the Rotary Club are engaged, members of the Rotary Club go out and do the work, and then Rotary grows its reputation because people in the community can see the work that Rotary is doing. Importantly also, the members are engaged and involved. And if you're like me, that's why most of us joined Rotary in the first place, because we want to be engaged and involved and doing things in some capacity. And that comes back again to what Mark mentioned in his membership drive uh, or membership presentation. So think about that. Um, don't just always be a fundraising and check writing club for, for other charities. As I say, that's, that's fine, but make sure that you consider this approach in your club as well. Um, just getting towards the end, there was just a, I just wanted to leave you with a couple of things here. These are the Rotary Foundation goals for 2020 and 21, and polio now and forever, of course. Um, increased contributions to the annual fund and polio plus. Um, and you can see there that the fundraising goal for this year is 410 million this coming year, 50 million for polio, which gets matched by the Gates Foundation and becomes 150 million, 135 million towards the annual fund, 85 million towards the endowment fund, and 40 million for other outright gifts. If we raise enough money, that whole issue of reducing the cash contributions that's happened to this year goes away, but we need to have the money in the foundation first to be able to support our projects and as point three says, improve the measurable, measurable impact of our grants. I ask that your clubs develop a, a plan to support the foundation. Again, many of you may have seen this particular example um, in planning the year ahead, as again, as DGE Mark said right at the outset, having goals helps you focus. So I'm asking you to consider whatever plan you like, however you want to make your plan for with your club, um, but just make sure that you've got a plan to support the foundation. The foundation is the cornerstone of the Rotary organisation. It works hand in hand with Rotary International um, and supports the great work that we do. Um, and of course, there's many uh, opportunities for individuals, individual Rotarians and non-Rotarians to also donate, donate to the foundation. So I'll just again, leave you with the message and ask you to consider the foundation as part of your own personal um, charity giving. 
Now, many of us simply can't be involved hands-on in major, major international projects that help communities prosper. Uh, like me, many of you would probably work or have other reasons why you can't um, travel to, uh, to work on some of those projects or as much as we would like. But we can support those Rotary projects and we can um, help those Rotarians that do undertake this life-changing work simply by supporting and donating to our own charity, the Rotary Foundation. I hope there were some good thoughts in there. Have a great year ahead and please include the Rotary Foundation in your planning for the next 12 months. And that's it for me. Thank you, Sam. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, it really does go to show the power of our foundation. I can see past District Governor Charlie Spears just relax there in the corner. I think every one of us need to harass uh, Charlie. Let's really drive him hard so that he actually has to sit upright and uh, start using that keyboard and really make foundation work. Oh, he's even gone further to sleep. Uh, really make foundation work hard for us. It is our charity. It is our passion and it is what really makes a difference across this great world of ours. And I'm just going to give one more extra plug. It's not too late. Remember, Wendy Froggart, District Governor's Partners Project is the end game. If your clubs have got any spare cash, please put it into that end polio end game program exactly what Sam was just talking about. We need the cash in there so that we can end polio. We will end polio. So thank you. That's it everyone. Thank you for attending today. Uh, it has been fantastic. You know, I was scanning through a lot of the things there. When I said we had 114 people online, I told you a lie because I then started to count the number of screens that had two people on there. So we, we have gone 120, 130 people plus. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you for spending the morning with us. I hope it has been informative. I hope you've all got something that has actually challenged you in some way. We've touched on membership, we've touched on goals, we've touched on foundation, we've touched on the My Rotary site. These are all great tools. They are all there for you to go and use. We are there to help you. We are there to support you. Don't think you have to do it all alone. Because as I said earlier, you know, you are going to have an awesome year. Why? Because we belong to an awesome organisation that really does change people's lives. So thank you all for attending. Presidents, elects, secretary elects, treasurer elects, uh, we've run a little bit over time. So I'll still give you a 15 minute break, but if we uh, come back, uh, at 12.15 uh, for your brief sessions. That will be absolutely fantastic. So everyone, thank you. Have a great rest of the day and we'll see you all online over the coming weeks. Bye for now.